Pray silence for the future Right Honourable, <laughs> hopeful Member of Parliament for Horsham, Mr James Smith, talk about open politics. Well, that was weird. <laughs> my, uh, yeah. my audible. Oh, there, oh. oh, you're there. Hello. Um, thank you all for coming. This is cool. Nice turnout. Um, yeah, I'm James Smith. Some of you know me, some of you don't. And I'm going to talk about how to stand for Parliament, or, as this talk could be called next year, the story of a terrible, terrible idea. Um, so, for those of you who don't know me, who am I? I'm, uh, I'm an engineer. I've been a software engineer for 18 years or something like that. I lose count. Um, I'm a parent. I've been a parent for about six years. And I'm reasonably activist with, along with those things. So. I've uh, you know, been tinkering around with uh, civic tech for many years, sort of on the, on the periphery of that uh, community. I've worked on things like uh, using the web for climate change, and now I'm looking at democracy. So uh, one thing I obviously have a problem with is achievable goals. Um, and so this. We, we have some problems, right, in, in democracy in, in this country and the way that democracy is working. And this, this is one of them, you know, general disengagement of, uh, of people with democratic process and how we, uh, you know, measured in turnout, that's going down. Um, you know, it used to be nearly 85%, which seems amazing. Um, and the problem is that as people become more and more disillusioned with the options they're presented with, new things become appealing and unfortunately, that means sometimes things like this, which, you know, if this is the only thing that we get to choose, that's you know, th that's different. That's, that's I find that quite disturbing. Um, so about a year ago, I was feeling very annoyed with politics and, uh, you know, the options available and so on. And I wrote a blog post about how depressing it all was and how much I disagreed with all of the options that I was being presented with, and how there was nothing I felt I could actually vote for. There was nobody out there that was actually representing me about, you know, representing what I wanted from the future. Um, so I wrote, I wrote the blog post, and I was inspired by. We saw a, a talk at Open Tech last year by uh, GDS, and this is a paraphrase because I can't remember exactly what they said. But the words that stuck in my head, whether I heard them or not, were that sometimes in order to change the system, you need to actually become part of the system, and that's what GDS have done that with civil service, which is really. Um, you know, you can't always change everything from the outside. And so I said in this blog post, you know what we should do? We, should, we need some new options. We should set up a GitHub repository and start collaborating in an open source way on some policy for a better future. And then I resolutely refused to do that because I already have far too many projects. Uh, so it was sort of throwing the idea out and hoping somebody else would do it. Uh, unfortunately, somebody did. Uh, where's Steve? <laughs> He's not here. Uh, he set up the repository, which then, you know, I just thought, oh, I'll just go in and change a couple of things. And one thing led to another. And over the last year, a bunch of us, a bunch of different contributors have been working on uh, using open source tools, you know, the sort of GitHub workflow, making changes, discussing them, merging them in, uh, working on building an actual manifesto. And this is the Open Politics Project. Uh, which is now a manifesto with a decent amount of policy in it uh, that's been discussed collaboratively, that we've built uh, together. And anybody can go and edit this. It's a little bit awkward because you need to learn how to use GitHub, but some, you know, a surprising number of people have actually managed that who've not been developers, which is quite nice. It's not the best thing, but you know, it's, uh, it's interesting. And, and it started as a, a kind of way of just inspecting your own ideas, your own assumptions and things, and holding them up for review, and doing something a bit more than just moaning on Twitter, and rather than saying, this is wrong, being able to say, well, this is, you know, this is what I'd do. So, so we did that for a while. Um, and then we, we've got a decent amount of stuff there now. It's, it's, there's some gaps, but it's, it's looking like a decent amount of, of, uh, of content. And after the European elections in May, I suppose it was. Um, I was feeling very annoyed with politics again, and this time, unfortunately, a year later, I thought actually you know, there's something that that I do think 
could be an option. There's a bunch of stuff that I do believe in that I could stand up for. So I decided that that's what I was going to do, however ill-advised that might be. So um, what I'm going to do in the talk is just sort of walk you through a few of the things I've learned over the last three months or so. Uh, it's not so much a how to stand for parliament, it's a how to stand for parliament so far. And uh, it might be a good deal longer next year or a good deal shorter, because I might have just decided the whole thing's terrible. Um, so, first thing to do, decide you actually want to stand, get pissed off, get, you know, realize there's nothing y you can, you know, y you decide the system wants to change, then, or needs to change, but nobody out there's gonna do it. Well, your civic duty in a democracy is to provide the option yourself to, to do something, to, uh, to, as Tom Watson suggested, to join the parties, to, to get involved, to stand for something else, or to create a new option. And that's open to everyone, because I have absolutely no idea what I'm doing. And when I started this, I had no idea what I'm doing, and I still don't. And that's OK, because we learn as we go along. You know, It's like hacking anything else. Nobody knows what they're doing when they start with a new bit of hardware or something. We just work it out as we go along, and democracy is no different. Um, then decide where you want to stand. Does anybody know who that is? Hey! Um, I live in Horsham, which is his constituency. Uh, and one of the things in our manifesto is that you know, parachuting people into safe seats and whatever is a bad idea, so people should stand where they live. So I have to stand where I live, uh, which is his constituency. It's incredibly safe. Um, and you know, it's, yeah, it's going to be interesting. But in a way, it being so safe is quite liberating, because actually it doesn't matter who I annoy. Um, and for people that want to vote for me, it doesn't matter, because they won't have to worry about letting somebody else in. So that's good. Uh, <laughs> got to look positive, right? Um, then decide, do you want to stand for a party? Do you want to stand as an independent? Is there an existing party that's right for you? Um, if there's not, what are you going to represent? Um, I kind of ignored this question for a while and just sort of started as independent, but I'll come back to that. Um, and one important thing is that I'm looking at this as a long haul thing, right? I'm not expecting to win in May. That would be ridiculous. Um, it's a long haul thing. And I think we're used to thinking about things on very short time scales in this you know, rapidly moving world of technology. But what we're looking at here is generational change for politics. You know, This is, if it's the same in 30 years time, then we'll have missed the opportunity. Uh, but we can, um, you've got to start somewhere. So this is where we start. So decided to stand. Next thing, get some online presence. Get something up there that people can see. Um, I created a very simple uh, website. I'm a developer. I know nothing about design, so Bootstrap's really handy for that. Um, having something that people can go and look at, see the very basics about who you are, what you stand for, and a way to get in touch or to be contacted. So a simple mailing list and a Facebook page. I really wish I didn't have to use Facebook for this, but everything, everyone's there. That's where everything's going on, and it's really annoys me that I have to use Facebook now more than I ever used to. And I wish I could delete my account, but I just can't. Um, so, sadly. Uh, I didn't worry about the name too much. I'll come back to that. But now you've got somewhere people can go. I don't know. Let's, let's announce it. What can go wrong? Um, I wrote a blog post announcing this and stuck it on Medium and my own blog. And then I thought, right, I'm going to wait. I'm going to wait for the perfect time to tell everybody about this. And then I waited about 10 minutes, got all itchy, and, and published it. Uh, because <laughs> it's just sitting there. What's the point of that? Um, so you know, bugger, proper timing, that's boring. Um, and within a couple of weeks, I'd had a chat with, that looks terrible up there, sorry about that. I'd had a chat with the local paper, who gave me a nice little half page write up explaining what I was doing. Um, the really interesting about thing about this is that so while a whole bunch of people online saw the blog post, a lot of people outside the constituency saw the blog post. Nobody in, in the constituency really did, uh, but but they did see that. So that gets you in the mind of locals uh, in the local constituency, and also the people who really read the local news are all the other candidates and all the councillors and people like that. They're reading the letters, and so yeah, one thing you have to do is start reading local newspapers, which is. Fine, it's fine. <laughs> I'm just not used to it. <laughs> That's all. 
Um, so, so that was really good because not, it, it's not that now everybody in the constituency knows who I am, but all the councillors do. And everyone who's involved in local politics knows, hang on, who, who the hell's this guy? Um, which is good. So I did that. That was cool. At this point, I thought, I wonder if any of this is legal. <laughs> because I hadn't checked. Uh, so at this point, I thought, oh, I'll call the Electoral Commission. Because you look on the Electoral Commission website, there's a whole load of information. It's actually really good. Um, they have now published their guidance for the next election, finally. Uh, though, obviously, I'm doing this a bit earlier than most other people do, apparently. Um, and, but it, it can lead you in circles a little bit. It's a little bit difficult to find what you need. But they've got phone numbers. Remember those? Um, you can phone up and talk to humans, and they're really, really helpful. And so phoning them up and saying, am I doing this right? Have I done something wrong already? Um, is really, really good. Unfortunately, I haven't. None of, you, know, you don't need to register anything or, or do anything you know, before you say, yes, I'm going to stand. So you can do that on a whim, because that's the best way to do these things. When it comes down to it, what you do need is you need to get nominated. You need to submit nomination papers before the, uh, before the election. You need 10 people to sign that. If you can't find 10 people to sign your nomination papers, then the entire thing is in trouble. So that hopefully will be fine. Um, and they have to be local, local residents. And then you have to put down a £500 deposit. And if you get 5% of the votes, you'll get it back. So that's the minimum. That's all you need in order to actually stand, to have your name down on the ballot paper. Um, obviously, it's better if you can do more, but that's the minimum. There are some rules around finances. So there are spending limits when you're campaigning. Uh, it depends on the size of the constituency. The, I think the limit in Horsham is about £32,000. Um, and that's divided into what they call long and short campaign periods, uh, you know, uh, based on you know, people tend to spend more nearer the election in the short campaign period, the long one goes a bit further back. If people donate your campaign, you have to verify who they are. You have to check against the electoral register to make sure that they're uh, valid donors, and that's quite interesting. As a, you know, it, it's an interesting logistical challenge um, as to how to actually do that, uh, because they could come from anywhere in the country. You have to actually make sure that they're not donating on behalf of somebody else who's already donated. You have to track the original source of the money, uh, rather than just, oh yeah, this guy's giving me some money. It doesn't matter where it comes from. Um, you also have to track all your expenditure. Uh, on various campaign uh, activities. And you have to include notional donations. So if somebody's giving you a bunch of their time for free, which would be really helpful, uh, you still have to count it at market rate for that as a donation. So that's, uh, that'll be interesting. Some interesting dates. Can anybody actually see that? It's a bit small, sorry. Um, interesting dates. The long campaign, when the, the finances start getting regulated, it doesn't really matter before that. That's around 18th of December. So until then, you can pretty much do what you like. The short campaign is only that last month before the election, after Parliament recesses, uh, or whatever the word is. Um, so the, most of the spending goes into that last month. Nominations only close literally one month before the polling day. So you can decide you know, in, in, at the end of April that you actually want to do this, and you can still, you can still do it. And then, of course, election day itself is going to be on the 7th of May. It's really quite useful. We now have fixed term parliaments, so we know when the next election's going to be, which is unusual. Uh, that's tiny. Sorry. Um, I've been tracking my expenditure. Uh, I work for uh, the Open Data Institute, and we're all about publishing data openly in structured formats and things that people can reuse. Uh, my expenditure, such as it is so far, it's not a lot, is published as open data, um, which I think with a, a schema designed by uh, Spend Network to, um, you know, to have, it was the kind of their dream list of all the things they'd want to know about election finance. So I was like, yeah, let's do it. When nobody cares what you do, it's, it's easy to do fun things like that. Um, so that's quite nice. Next thing to do is start looking into the data around the election. So there's a lot of data that's published about the outcomes of elections and the spending and so on. Uh, this is some of the uh, some useful stats. These are the actual votes. You really can't see that at all. Uh, the actual votes cast in the last general election in Horsham. So the Conservatives got just under 30,000. It was about 28,000 votes. Uh, Lib Dems around 17,000 and so on. So it's quite a, quite a drop off. And then a bunch of minor parties down there. Uh, Labour are not really figuring in anything. And UKIP are down there as well. So 
But you know, useful stuff like knowing actually how many voters there are. There's 77,000 voters in the constituency, and 55,000 of them voted. So 72% turnout, which is well above the average. So that's, what does that mean? That's interesting. I, I expected with a safe seat that actually it was going to be lower turnout. People weren't really going to bother because it didn't make any difference. So that was surprising. There's an interesting correlation here. The next one is spending. And the spending follows pretty much the same pattern. Um, the orange bar is the short campaign. The blue bar is the long campaign. So you see, obviously, most of the spending goes into the short campaign. What's interesting here, you probably can't make out the scale, but that's about 7,000, 7,500 pounds. The Conservatives who got those 28,000 votes who you know, owned the constituency basically only spent about 11,500 pounds. Again, that was a lot less than I expected. The spending limit's about 32. None of them got anywhere near. So that was, uh, that was fun. Um, this, this, this is nice. Notice a gap here. That gap is the Green Party. Uh, I always wondered why I didn't get a leaflet from them. And, uh, and now I know. When I, when I first announced, a couple of people, two different people said to me, what are you doing? Why are you splitting the green vote? What's, it's crazy. You, know, you obviously believe in a lot of the same things they do. What are you doing? And I've since looked at the stats. They got 570 votes, and they spent no money. So I really don't care. <laughs> they, they don't want my vote. They don't want the constituency. So you know, that's one thing about parties choosing where they're going to fight. Right? They, they really don't care. What I don't, I don't understand why they bothered. That's all. So. Next, a bit of financial planning. What am I actually going to need to spend? And I'm still working this out, but this is just what I've worked out so far. On top of the deposit, um, the main thing I want to do is I want to make sure I get a leaflet in every, through every door, right? Tom, just grinning. Stop grinning. <laughs> You're going to correct everything later. Um, I think it's really interesting to learn that you get a free delivery through the door by the Royal Mail. They'll deliver your leaflet for you once. Um, so that's how they all do that. I didn't know that was a thing. So actually, if I can get the leaflets printed and get them to the Royal Mail, then I can get one through every door, which is great. They'll do it addressed or unaddressed, so you can actually send one to every voter or just to every household, or apparently there are hacks that let you do a bit of both, um, though I don't know anything about that. And you can phone up the Royal Mail. They have an elections department. And again, they're really helpful. They love, uh, seem to love people calling them and, and like explaining the whole system. Um, and they'll tell you useful things like how many, they, how many households they delivered to in the EU elections. And that was 47,000 last time. So I'm going to need 47,000 plus a bit leaflets to get one through every door. And going to some local printers and working out the cost, that's going to cost me about 1,500 quid, which I thought would be way higher than that. This seems disturbingly accessible to actually get a message across to people. And this comes back to the, the, the sort of the paper candidates and the minor parties who never got a leaflet through my door. If you can't raise two grand, why are you bothering? What's, what's the point of having someone on, on paper and not trying to get the message across? I, I, I don't really understand. Um, so that's kind of where I've got on the financial planning. Obviously, there's going to be a load more, but that's where we are at the moment. I'm learning as we go along. I'm blogging all of this and, and trying to. Uh, you know, explain it in public as I go. One of the things I really want to do is crowdfund that money. So not really because I really need to, but because if we can show that it's crowdfundable and that anybody can say, I want to stand and crowdfund the money, that's helpful. It opens up the options for people. It makes the whole system more accessible. Um, because you have to prove who your donors are, and you have to reject donations that are uh, not from proper donors. 10, good. Um, you have to reject donations that are not from proper donors. This is going to be interesting. So actually, how that works, we'll have to work out. I'm hoping to talk to some crowdfunding companies to, to try and work that out. Um, so we'll see. Research the area. Find out about the local area. I mean, I've lived in Horsham constituency for nine years, but there's still uh, so much stuff that I don't know. Uh, I didn't grow up there, so obviously I'm... Uh, you know, going to have a lot to learn. Work out what the local issues are. Uh, for us, where we are, there are big issues around housing development. Uh, Gatwick is just to the north of us, so second runway at Gatwick is a, a thing that's going to affect local residents. And we're right in the middle of the weald, so we have shale gas right underneath. Um, and so that's something that's, that's concerning people. Um, and that sort of leads into potential allies and things and other local groups that you can, 
you can talk to, get in touch with local groups. I mean, our, our town has a really active Facebook group. Engaging on there is really important. Talking to other pressure groups, community groups, youth groups. There's a, a youth council in the town. Um, it's going to be really, really useful. One of the ones that I really like is to do with the fracking thing. Uh, who knows where Bolcom is? Well, not where it is. Who's heard of Bolcom? Right, you knew. So, obviously. Um, so, Bolcom was the center of the uh, protests last year, a couple of years ago, uh, against the sort of early fracking exploration wells where Caroline Lucas got herself arrested and a bunch of other things. Um, and that's in my constituency, which is cool. My constituency, you know what I mean? Um, <laughs> it's where I live, it's fine. Um, which is really great because they've not just objected to the fracking, but they've formed a group that's creating a solar farm to power the entire village. So they're not just saying no, they're saying let's do something better. And that really ties in with, with the way that I think, and, it, and it's lovely to have them in the area. So there's some really nice sort of things like that that you might learn. The other thing is, what's the shape? What, what is this place? Um, can anybody see that? You can make out the wiggly line, maybe. Um, just working out what the boundary is, it's not what you think. It's, uh, the electron boundaries are weird, and they keep changing. Um, but the Ordnance Survey have a really helpful thing, which shows you the boundaries. And then I thought, right, I'm going to have a big map on my wall. So I ordered a custom map from the OS. If you ever get a chance to order a custom map from the Ordnance Survey, do. It's wonderful. You can run your hands across it and feel the print. It's lovely. Um, so then I drew on it with a felt tip. Uh, <laughs> because, because you can't just print out the election boundary. That'd be far too easy. So yeah, it's, uh, now I have a felt tipped OS map on my wall. That, yeah. this here, this is Crawley, uh, which is labor, <laughs> I think. Um, so yes, it's, we're, we're sort of a very rural constituency. Uh, Balcom's over here. That's Horsham, that's Crawley. Gatwick's up there somewhere. Um, so yeah, so that's fun. Public meetings, they're fun. We had a public meeting uh, with a grand total of 10 people. Twice as many as I expected. It was really good. And that was great. We had a couple of other candidates turn up and sort of councillor candidates. It was really handy to just sort of verify those assumptions about what the local issues are. They were actually, you know, it's not obviously a great sample, but just starting to, this is something I'm going to have to do a lot more of, starting to do meetings, surgeries, whatever, to, uh, to meet up with people. And then the other thing I need to do a lot more of is write. Write a lot. Write to the paper. Uh, local papers are desperate for opinion pieces all the time. They're desperate for things to print. Um, so, you know, we need to be writing those, writing letters, all sorts of things. Uh, writing all the time, which can get a bit tiring. But So, there's a few things I didn't bother doing at the beginning. I didn't assemble a team, because they'll kind of choose themselves later on, I figure. I don't know if anybody's interested. Um, I didn't optimize my personal brand. I'm not going to start wearing suits. I'm not going to change my Twitter handle, which is frankly ridiculous. Um, you know, I'm not going to be like James for Horsham, because that would be shit. Um, I didn't bother chasing the media particularly. I, I think, you know, I'm very, um, I want to, you know, this to be a kind of a, not sort of case of those traditional ideas of having big splashes in, in media and things like that. We can do this organically. We have the technology, right? So let's not bother with that. And I didn't agonize over naming. I launched with what was quite frankly a terrible name. Uh, of Open Horsham, it's just appalling. And, and I hated it when I chose it, but it was just like, you know, there are three hard, hard, hard fucked up the joke now, two hard problems in computer science. <laughs> Naming things, cache invalidation and off by one errors. But if you say three, it doesn't work. Well done. <laughs> so where next? That's kind of where I am now. So where next is kind of a, an adventure over the next best part of a year to work out what the hell else I need to do. How to actually get some votes. Um, engage with local people. I need to do a lot more writing, talking, meeting people, and working out what's going on. Uh, it's not a great detailed to-do list. Uh, it's very vague. I just want to answer a couple of questions that I'm often asked, and, and the things that are often good, often put to me. Why bother? Right? Voting doesn't change anything. If it did, they'd disallow it. Um, Standing won't change anything. I'm standing in a safe seat. What, what, what difference is it going to make? Um, the way I figure it is, if you think that things are wrong, you've got a couple of options. You need to take part, whether that's by joining parties, uh, as Tom suggested last night, whether it's by standing up for something yourself, 
you need to take part, you need to get involved. Because the only other option is not moaning on Twitter. The only other option is to get out in the streets, right? And unless you're going to do that, we have a system that you can work within. When that breaks, feel free. Um, the other one is and often around sort of the surveillance conversations and things. Yeah, but what if we, you know, we, we need to work on better security software? We need to get people using encryption, particularly around surveillance. Um, that's true, but it doesn't answer the, the whole thing. I think if you want to end up as the technological underground in some uh, dystopia, then that's probably OK. I mean, they have cool outfits. That's all right. Um, it probably won't be that cool. Matrix reference, that's really quite dated. I couldn't think of anything else. <laughs> um, I don't really want to end up there. It seems like a lot of hard work. I'd rather have a society I actually want to live in, not one that hates me, basically. So I'm going to come back to the independent thing. I'm nearly done. Um, I don't think that standing as an independent is the right way uh, for me to go. This is a ballot paper. I'm fairly sure taking a photo of your ballot paper is illegal, but there's a lot of them online. So whoever this guy is, wouldn't want to be him. Um, I don't know where he lives. Somewhere in Hove. Anyway, um, the interesting thing about this list here, right? Labour, Green Party, Lib Dems, UKIP, Conservatives. Oh, there's a sort of space there. The really annoying thing about being an independent is you don't have a, that kind of brand. You don't have any brand identity, and people don't see it on the ballot paper. They all get a logo. I think you even get a tagline or something. It's just. And you've just got independent and your name. You've got to make people aware of your name. And my name's James Smith. <laughs> it's quite depressing. Um, so I don't think that's really good enough. And the other thing is that if I stand as an independent and I make some progress and I get a bunch of people behind me, and then uh, this time next year I decide that this is just so awful that I don't ever want to do it again, nobody can pick it up and carry on. Right? It's just lost. All that effort is lost. So I'm much more concerned about building a movement. I think we need a new political option. We need a new movement in this country. And so you've got to build something, uh, something different, something exciting, and something new. And this is the thing that we're going to build. That's the name. That's what's going to be on the ballot paper, uh, which is quite nice. It's like a little mind virus. You thought you initially, you look at it and you go, huh? And then you think, ooh. And you think, ah. and you do that for about 15 minutes. Um, and every time you mention it to yourself, you, you, it's like a little confirmation bias in your head. And every time you think negatively about it, you think, oh, no, I don't want something new. No. It's <laughs> this is what we're working with at the moment. It's uh, inherently optimistic. It's looking forwards. Right? And that's something that's really lacking at the moment in, in politics in this country. So we'll see how that turns out. And we're looking at a movement of, with, with principles of, of democracy, of reinvigoration of democracy, of transparency for governments, for companies, liberty and privacy for individuals, as opposed to the other way around, which is what we have at the moment. <laughs> Everything's transparent for you guys. The companies uh, have as much privacy as they want. So that seems a little bit backwards. Rationality around evidence base around policy is, is, you know, is important. The courage to take hard decisions, to look to you know, the future for problems that are difficult to deal with in that normal chasing tomorrow's headline cycle. We need something with a bit more courage. And we need something optimistic, something that's saying, actually, we can make the future better, not that's campaigning in a negative way and saying, God, aren't all these things awful? Look at all those horrible poor people. They're taking your money. It's something optimistic. Some optimism in, in politics, I think, is, is really lacking. And in a party designed to deprecate itself, right? To work within the system to create a party that will work to make sure that parties aren't necessary. Because we can do things better. We don't have to send MPs to Westminster on a horse anymore. I mean, the, the digital democracy thing earlier was you know, talking about how we can do things better. Um, and we can go there. We can work on that. But something designed to uh, explicitly to deprecate itself is what we're looking at. So I'm done. I'm nearly done. It's 250 days. Today, it is 250 days till the 2015 general election. That's the time we've got left. And so who thinks, quick survey, who thinks there should be more people like us 
technologically capable, you know, um, understanding of the, the world we find ourselves in. Who thinks there should be more people like us in, in power in Parliament? Okay, good. Who would like to see that in our lifetime? Right. So if not you, then who? Probably. <laughs> I hope that's not the answer. But, you know, we're here. We're, we're the one, we're, it's our generation now, and we're growing up, and it's time to take some responsibility. So, that's me, you can find me there. That's the Open Politics Project. And we're having a meetup for anybody interested in democracy, uh, politics, digital democracy, all those things, half eight in the workshop just over there. Come and join us and ask lots of questions and discuss things. I'm done. Have I gone over time? <laughs> we've, got, we've got time for a couple of questions. Um, actually, I can think of one. Who here would vote for James? Say aye. <laughs> That's not bad. <laughs> so. Sorry? Excellent. That's fine. <laughs> do, do we have any questions now or a, or a voice player? Um, I'll let you choose. Go for it. <laughs> uh, hello. What hello. do you think the odds are you'll get your deposit back? Not great. Um, no, I'm, that's kind of the aim. It would be really, really good to get deposit back this time. That's quite unlikely, to be fair. I'm going into this realistically, but I'm going into it knowing that this is the first. It's not the last. It's not the only time. Right, this is going to be something that's going to have to, as I said, it's a generational change. We keep going until we're the white-haired old guys. <laughs> <laughs> I'm getting white-haired already. It's losing the youth vote with the, uh, the grey. Given what you've just answered just then, this might be a bit redundant, but um, have you made any preparations towards becoming an MP and the day-to-day -day of what that would involve? Uh, no. No, not really. Um, no, I suspect that's probably not going to be an immediate issue. Obviously, it's an aim. Obviously, I'm in the race to try and to try and win, to try and convince people that there is something better. But realistically, this time probably not. Um, I hear there are training courses, <laughs> but they don't offer them to people who they don't expect to win. So that's fine. Um, this takes uh, obviously a lot of time and stuff. I mean, what about your day job? <laughs> Ask the guy behind you. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, that's. Uh, don't actually ask him. Good God. Um, <laughs> uh, but evenings are good, um, but also I have children. It's difficult to fit it in. And one thing, I, one of the, the things I've said to um, my my wife, when I was you know the first person I discussed this with, obviously when I was considering standing, was with my wife to say, look, I understand this is going to be difficult, but, you know, if it starts to affect children or family or anything like that, then fine, that's, you know, that's it, it's done. You have to be realistic and appreciate the impact it's going to have. It's going to be very difficult. Uh, I'm probably going to be taking some time off in April. And <laughs> <laughs> uh, you, well, Technically, I think you can do it, but that was a really bad idea. I wouldn't want to. Um, yeah, I don't know. They'll have to find somebody else. <laughs> so I, I think you're, there's two things I wanted to say. One is your name, James Smith. It just made me immediately think, well, you are every man. And I think that's oh, quite a powerful thing. <laughs> and uh, the other it thing is, it, that. <laughs> I like the idea of that you're, you're not intending to win almost, you're intending to set a precedent, you're yeah. like creating a new model, yep. it's really important. And it reminded yep. me of in Italy... to raise Italy, a level of debate as well. Yeah, and it reminded me, in Italy, there was that um, party that just really blitzed the social networks and they really yep. got on everyone on board and then they got in. Yes. I and then they were like, okay, okay we've got in, actually star. we don't know what to do. Yeah, yeah. And then they handed it back over to the people that ha had the skills. But yep. next time they're ramping up their, their sort of membership yep. and then they're going to come in and really hit them hard. So I think... It's really yeah, yeah. Brilliant. I mean, it, this is about building movements. It's it's stuff that you know does take time to build and needs a lot of people involved. Um, let's say you win and you are now <laughs> uh, James weird. Smith MP, independent or something new. 
what do you do next? How, how realistically do you expect that you can enact progressive change in Parliament? As an individual MP, I'm pretty sure Tom would uh, back me up. Uh, none at all. Right. Um, it needs something bigger than that. You need to have a whole bunch of people. You need to have a... Um, yeah, I mean, look how long it's taken. The, the other parties have hundreds of years of, uh, of history. I mean, UKIP have taken 20 years to get within spitting distance of maybe having one. Um, it takes a long time. But, you know, you've got to try. Okay. Did that answer the question at all? Probably not. <laughs> exactly. That's it. The more of us you stand, the... Uh, the more chance we'll have. So I have a question. So you, you, you have a movement. You don't have a party. The idea is you are yourself. Now, Currently, yes. OK, disclaimer, I'm a member of a political party. So mm -hmm. the reason why I joined a political party is that despite it not being perfect, mm -hmm. I can yep. share a set of core values with that yep. party. The problem I see with this new way of doing Sorry. So the reason why I have some doubts about this other way of doing mm -hmm. politics is that people need to identify or generally need to identify Absolutely. with a yeah, set yeah. of core values. Yeah. If these values are not well defined, yeah. they will either change from time to time mm -hmm. or become, you know, their variance will be yeah. quite high. Yeah. And that's a problem we've seen, from, I'm from Italy, we've seen that quite a lot with movements. Yeah. They, they, you know, they tend to get together right-wing extremist and left-wing mm -hmm. extremist how would you address that or how do you think this can address so i problem? think i think you're right um people vote for parties because of the values not necessarily because of the things they do i think we see that with the main parties they're trading on values that they've had for a very long time but don't actually seem to pay much attention to anymore but people still vote for them based on those values um i think there's a set of values that's not being expressed by any of the options. I think there's a set of values that I would hope a lot of people here share about uh, moving into a, a better future, about using uh, technology to make the world better, about, you know, that we're, we're looking forward, and, and I don't see that in any of the existing parties necessarily. Um, they're, you know, very split down the, the traditional political lines, whereas we have perhaps a new way forward combining bits of both to. Uh, to move to something more, uh, more dynamic, more uh, forward-looking. Ran out of words there. Hello. Um, Hello. I have a question about um, in Horsham. How did the local councillors and existing concentrations of power respond to you coming onto the scene and your announcement? <laughs> um, so I haven't spoken to that many of them yet. Um, I think they probably think it's a bit strange. Um, there are some other independents in Horsham who are going to be standing for the council and hopefully to build some kind of alliance with them would be very good, uh, the sort of you know, confluence of, uh, of interest. There is generally a, there's a really interesting trend at the moment in Horsham where there, there's a lot of secrecy in the local council and one of the local papers is campaigning on transparency in local council which is, you know, plays right into, into my hands which is really nice. So it's, uh, yeah, it'll be interesting. I need to talk to the other candidates. I haven't met Francis yet, so. I did write to him about Drip and said, I'm standing against you next year. Could you not vote for this, please? Sorry? Tweet Tweeted Francis him? No, he doesn't have, well, uh, he doesn't have a Twitter account. That's his. Uh, I'm told that he has one that he uses to read, <laughs> but not an actual identity, apparently. Uh, Any more? I'm afraid we're, we're one more afraid for now. We're, out, we're, we're oh. pretty much out of time. I, I apologize. But do go to the tent yes, at half, uh, eight. half eight. In the um, workshop. As much Come as much you us. want to drink. Yeah, bring a beer. <laughs> as long as you bring it yourselves. Um, but yeah, no, so thank you very much, James Smith. Thank you. Thank you.